Welcome to Metabolic Matters Podcast, where we embark on conversations with thought leaders, disruptors, change agents, and passionate souls. Together, we'll delve into what truly matters to them. And you'll learn how to metabolize this newfound wisdom so you can transform your own metabolic health. Now let's meet today's guest. When my co-founders, Steve Ottersberg and Cindy Kennedy, were exploring well-vetted and scientifically sound organizations in the psychedelic-assisted therapy space in response to a growing number of inquiries among our doctors, our advocates, and patients, they stumbled upon Humans Are Good, an organization committed to scientific research, frameworks for improving mind-body health, and media and entertainment for good. Enter stage right, Raj Jana, former reservoir engineer, 40 under 40 entrepreneur, media host, also co-founder of Humans Are Good, and current CEO of Liberate, a, a human transformation company that helps people track and resolve the root emotional causes contributing to health and relationship challenges. Raj is passionate about building businesses and spreading messages that shift consciousness on our planet. Just like the MTIH methodology to test, assess, and address, to get the most precise and personalized care for patients with cancer, Raj has the same approach and methodology in the emotional precision healing space. It seemed like a match made in heaven when humans are good and the app liberate were beta tested on the Metabolic Terrain Institute of Health Network, revealing powerful insights and interventions to change mental as well as physical outcomes, improving the lives of our patients and their loved ones enduring the cancer journey. And now, several years later, hundreds of participants later, and dozens of ahas later, especially in relation to psychoneuroendocrine immunology, we know this is just the beginning of a movement to further change the cancer conversation. Join me in discovering how our thoughts, namely our experiences with the big and little T's, also known as traumas, and the internal programming that goes with it, lays the groundwork to make or break our health. I can't wait for you to listen in on my conversation with Raj. Ah, Hi. Raj. We're back. <laughs> the band is back together. The band is back together. So I love where I want to even tell, first of all, if you know people for the pro about you, but what I always think happens, I wish we were always recording what's happening before we go on for these mm. conversations, because that's sometimes where some of the most hilarious fodder comes from. And so <laughs> one of my favorite things, I just want the audience to tune in on this right now is, um, we were talking about Raj's podcast voice and <laughs> amazing microphone. And so he was, we were just kind of having a groove out and I feel like I'm missing out. I feel like I need to go and get myself a podcast sounding microphone. It just turns on the persona. You're like, you know, yeah. you've got like your, your real life. And then all of a sudden you're like, all right, I'm here to serve. Let's go. Like you, it's it. like your cape. You put on your cape and you're like, all right, let's, let's bring our best. You know what I mean? I totally know what you mean. And this is what I think is so fun about having a conversation with you and for people to kind of voyeur in on this conversation, because one of the things you and I, part of how we connected is mm. in our silliness and our zest for joy and finding joy in life and connection, even when things are really, really hard and really yeah. uncomfortable. And so that's actually one of my favorite things about you that you really allow, um, I guess the sort of the stretching of the human condition in every direction it needs to go. And so I, I want to take our, our listeners on a little bit of a journey to understand who is Raj Jana and this amazing <laughs> podcast voice. And so I'm going to start off, we're just going to go big right from the very first question. Okay. How in the world did you move from a petroleum engineer and all the iterations of your life? to where we are today, to become someone who is passionate about an expert in the creation of precision emotional healing. Whew, I mean, <laughs> okay, that's a loaded question, but I will do my best to 
weave an, a story arc uh, that can tell the, the full story without getting lost into the details. So petroleum engineer um, was not happy. I wasn't meant to be. I worked for a big oil company at the time and uh, read my read a, a book called The 4-Hour Workweek, which uh, was by a guy named Tim Ferriss, who's also where I learned about this mic because um, that's the mic that he uses on his podcast. And it just opened my world to uh, a whole realm of possibilities around um, just entrepreneurship and what that was. So then I started reading a ton of books and started trying little side hustles. Um, and one of my first side hustles uh, became my main hustle. It was a, a successful coffee company. But when I was launching my coffee company, I was still working full time and I had a mentor who worked at the same company die of a heart attack three months before his retirement date. And he, uh, it just really kind of shocked me in a really big way. And that was the first moment where I started waking up to this idea of more. Like, okay, like this thing that I was told that you come in, you do the work, you put in your hours, and one day you'll retire and then you'll be happy. That was not true. Um, so that really led to a whole wave of me wanting to share more of that message. Hey, don't wait start now. Don't wait, like lean in today. And we started really sharing those messages through my, um, through my podcast. So my podcast stay grounded started as a tagline for my first company, which was a coffee company Love it. on so that cool. pod on the podcast. Uh, we've done over three, almost over 300 episodes now. So one every week for five years, but it started at the time, just knowing nothing about it. And Around that time is when I also left my full-time job because my coffee company was starting to be successful. And I'd left, um, and then I just started, went on this really gnarly ride of entrepreneurship, which was emotion, which was emotionally chaotic. Uh, I, I'm the first entrepreneur in my family. Um, and so my nervous system wasn't equipped to handle the stressors that come from going from a, a stable, like secure full-time job to being somebody who had large sums of money come in and out and being hit with different environmental challenges and business challenges. And it, it was like a lot for my nervous system. And my podcast started turning into this place where I would actually bring on guests to help me out. <laughs> so I would wow. like, I'd be reading books on, on mental health or emotional well-being or moving through fear. And then I'd go get the experts to actually come on my show and just work with me. And so I was getting a lot of uh, support in that way. And that's what really opened me up to this sort of world of the internal landscape, right? There's this whole world of personal development and personal growth. And then there's, you know, what's going on in your nervous system when you're experiencing stress, which are almost like one is very skills focused, like let's learn the tools and the things to become more positive, to to, to, to have better habits. And then the other side was like, okay, like what's going on inside of Raj. And it wasn't until, you know, as I started launching the podcast, I started, you know, really going deeper on that path. Um, that's when I, I was also in a nine year relationship. And, um, as that nine year relationship, as business started getting better, I realized how little I was focusing on my relationship and how little I was focusing on my health. And so my focus went from being here to then focusing on that. And when I started going down that route is when um, I think if I had to think of where precision emotional healing began, mm. it began in those moments where I was starting to ask myself the hard questions of why I wasn't proposing to my former partner. And the answers were not found in my mind because I couldn't find them. So I hired a hypnotherapist to help me go into my unconscious mind. And that's where I uncovered mountains of um, shame and guilt and uh, an emotional wounding that was getting in the way of me opening my heart more, of me allowing love in. I had fears of commitment. I had fears so much there that I couldn't really unpack. And then as that was happening... I went through a, a really significant period of erectile dysfunction as at the age of 27, which was a lot. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. So at the age of 27, you know, young man who, you know, had seemingly had everything going for him all of a sudden 
I was opening up all these aspects of myself. And then now my body was actually responding in a way that wasn't. Um, and that was the first time I was like, oh, wow, this mind, these, these emotions, these core wounds, these beliefs that I have about myself are all contributing to a physical symptom that I have. And, um, and then that started a whole wave of me going into different types of modalities and therapeutics. I invested over a million dollars over the next several years just going on my own healing journey and meeting others on the journey. And that's when I realized just how difficult it is for us to sort of unpack and understand and actually get results um, on this emotional health path. Like we can do the meditations, we can go to the breath works, we can even go to the the plant medicine ceremony is south of the border and you know you can do all the things and at the end of the day like it's complicated it's confusing there's there's so many tools and there's no guarantee of outcomes and that's when um mike my business partner and chief science officer and emily my co-founder and chief product officer um, at Liberate, we started coming together to really look at this problem and say, okay, there's got to be a more data-driven, um, science-backed, effective, and efficient way to help people navigate their internal landscapes um, with a lot more grace, with a lot more efficiency, with less cost um, that lead to very specific outcomes. And that's where precision emotional healing came to be. Um Gosh. So long story. You do ask for a big story. Like that was a big question to start. There had to be lifetimes between that moment of, you know, oh, I did my best to like squeeze it all. It was beautiful because I, I feel like I know you pretty well. We've spent a lot of time together the last couple of years yeah. and learning and, and creating like you helping our community, us, you know, theoretically helping your community, which you'll talk yeah. about here in a moment as well. I feel like I've known a lot about you, but you actually brought forth a few other pieces that I didn't have all of it. And what, what strikes me here of what you shared is just the fact that all of us have a story, right? All of us have a, a biography that has led to our biology. Mm. Um, all of us, you know, we might have come into the world stepping into a particular box or career or relationship or friendship or parental relationship, whatever, with certain expectations, you know, maybe laid on us by other people, not just ourselves. And then you show so beautifully that you kind of did have everything like, okay, here's, I've, I've got this high end, high paying job, this career, da, 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 da. And that was so unfulfilling. And then this next place opened up into, oh, what else is out there for me when you started to learn? And then it made you start to reflect back to the rest of the components of your life. Yeah. I think what you bring us is you show us that we all carry a story and that you, you also showed us that it is, um, it's a dynamic process that where we were does not necessarily equate to where we are or where we will be in the future. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think you also let people understand that it's like, just because it's this way right now, doesn't mean that's forever, right. Good or bad. So I think that's really powerful. And then the awarenesses you had along the way that made you start to look at your life in a much more honest and authentic way and yeah. to tune in to, am I in resonance or coherence with what I perceive my life should be and what I'm feeling and experiencing in my, in my being. I think mm. you just like highlighted in that story, all the things that is is like we're, we all need to be doing. We all are constantly evaluating. It's probably a source of pain and um, discomfort for many people to be hearing this and maybe realizing they may too be in a nine-year relationship that's not working or a career that feels really unfulfilling or a, a physical condition that is terrifying, you know, to know what's going to happen with it. So I think that your story is gorgeous. I appreciate that you took us on that journey with you and were so vulnerable about it. And I think finally, the big highlight here is the key word of vulnerability. And so mm -hmm. in that, there's three definitions I'd love for to tackle with you, kind of know what they look like in the Wikipedia realm or the chat GPT realm. But I want people to hear your definition of these three concepts. And we'll start with the first one. How would you personally, and maybe you as your collective with Liberate and your co-founders define emotional intelligence? 
Oh, you asked very beautiful questions and I appreciate all of those reflections. I really want to name that before I dive into this. Um, thank you for seeing me. Um, emotional intelligence to me, and I think each person has a different word for it, but it encompasses a lot of different skill sets, right? So there's emotional awareness. One is like being able to be aware that you have emotions and that you are not your emotions, right? Like, I think we get caught in this loop of saying, I am anxious. Mm. I am an anxious person instead of I am feeling anxiety in this moment, mm. right? Like, so the ability to create spaciousness between you and the emotion is one facet of being an emotionally intelligent human being. And that's emotional awareness and being able to name the emotion um, just from the witness standpoint, but then there's other facets to that, right? There's being able to sit with the emotion and being able to sit mm -hmm. comfortably uh, with the emotion. And, and that's another set of skills. It's emotional regulation, right? Being mm -hmm. able to hold space for the emotion within you and, and not need to do anything with it, not needing to, and, and this can come in a lot of different forms, right? Like they can come with reaching for the food. Like there's an emotion that happens before you reach for the food. There's an emotion that happens before you do anything. And so being able to cultivate that spaciousness yeah. is another facet of being an emotionally intelligent human being. Um, and then I do believe that being able to communicate your emotions with others is another big part of 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 emotion of being an emotionally intelligent human being. And I think vulnerability plays into that, like being able to communicate what you are experiencing without needing to blame the other person, project on the other person, make the other person wrong, but you are owning your experience and not saying, "Hey, you did this to me." Or it's like, hey, I am experiencing this feeling right now as a result of something you said. Yeah. And that phrasing right there even is is one aspect of being an emotionally intelligent human being. And I think um, if I had to name a, a, a fourth, it's being able to have empathy Oof, for, yeah. for, for another's experience. And, and, and empathy is different from compassion, right? Like compassion, I would say, is like a one-way street. It's like it doesn't matter what they're experiencing. It's being able to just love what they're what the other person is doing and it doesn't really require you to be emotionally intelligent to be compassionate you can just love them for what they're experiencing but empathy for me requires you to kind of put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see and and actually see their pain for what it is yeah and and this is where you know there's a lot of training that can get to, like a lot of learning gets to happen like this isn't necessarily just coming from practice this is you know a lot of principles and stuff that you can learn around empathy like for example you know just knowing that when somebody's inside of an emotional experience you know that that is actually their nervous system yes. you know responding to a perceived threat in the moment well where did that nervous system learn that response in childhood Right. And so being able to connect with, wow, so there's like this scared, um, anxious child right now that's lodged in their nervous system that's actually presenting itself right now as this emotional experience. And being able to see that for what it is is a part of having emotional intelligence. Um, so I hope that answers your question. But like, you know, I, I like to think of emotional intelligence and break it out because then it, allows it to seem more like a skill set that can be built as Love opposed it. to like, oh, this person's just born with an IQ. No, like EQ for sure is something that I believe every human being has the capacity to develop um, within themselves over time. I love it. I think that also gives hope, right? Yeah. To some people listening to this that may themselves be dealing and struggling with their own perceived emotional intelligence or in relationship or partnerships with yeah. folks that might be struggling with that. And and when you practice that for yourself, it does create um, tolerance and less judgment. Um, you know, I don't know if you heard, we had a, a conversation with Zach Bush recently, and he talked about sort of one of the tenets that would probably help all of us serve humanity a little bit better is to let go of our judgment. And I think mm. that is sort of the precursor to getting to that point is 
starting to cultivate your own emotional intelligence. Um, so I think that was really powerful how you broke that down and described it. You also said something that stuck with me about when you see someone else in that reactive space, you know, instead of you meeting their real, like I see your reaction and I'll up you two with my own, yeah. you know, that doesn't work out ever. <laughs> I mean, we're kind of seeing that on the global platform as well, which is a horrible, horrible place to be because we all lose in those moments. We yeah. all do. We all suffer more from those moments. So what was interesting is I got to spend some time with um, a hero of mine that his work before his books ever even came to be, um, his research was compelling me in my own studies to become a psycho neuroimmunology major when I was an undergrad back in the early 1990s, which was the work of Dr. Bruce Lipton. Yes. While he was still at Stanford and all of those places, well, he was still very academia learning these new concepts. And a good 13 years before his first book, Biology of Belief, came out, I was reading the clinical, you know, the medical scientific research behind these ideas. But he taught. Of course you were. Of course I was, right? I mean, I was in my own savior ass university at that time. So I was scouring for these types of things. But I got to finally be with him in person, like in real time, meet this person who's been a longtime hero, which was just crazy because he's even more delightful in, in human mm -hmm. form than he was in my in my mind. Um, and so, But one of the things he talked about, and you, you alluded to this, like really when, when you're meeting somebody in their pain place, it's often something that happened to them before the age of seven. And that it creates this deep programming. Yeah. I'm going to talk about this in a moment. We won't go into this entirely, but I want to put kind of put this on the parking lot because that's one of the coolest things that I think the Liberate Project does yeah. is to help take people back to the origin of some of these processes so you can rewrite your narrative in a very different way. And so I just was curious if that seven-year-old piece that he alludes to is showing up for you in your research. We can go deeper into it in a moment, but does that resonate with you of what he describes of that programming at that age? Yeah, I mean... The uh, zero to seven is is really the place where our, our brains are most impressionable, mm -hmm. right? Like the prefrontal cortex really hasn't developed up until that point yet. So your 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 amygdala, your you know your 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 protective mind is actually literally like all it cares is to feel safe at the end of the day. And so like anything that is a perceived threat, and threats don't have to mean physical threats. Yes. Because to if you think about it, go back to a child. Yeah. If a four-year-old child is left alone in a grocery store, mom and dad are just like around the corner over there, but the child can't see mom and dad. All of a sudden, the child is left to his or him like freaking out. Yeah. And even if mom and dad love the child deeply, doesn't matter. In that moment, that is a perceived threat. Okay. And there's going to be an interpretation of that threat back to the child because at that point there's and there's so much bodies of work and research around how even the ego you know like mm -hmm. the, the our personalities don't really begin to develop until you know later on in life like at that age we can't tell the difference between me and mom and dad so Ooh. Ooh. it's like you can't even understand why mom and dad are leaving it's just that i'm alone Wow. And that program of I am alone, that program of, of, of that, that's now in the unconscious mind. Mm. And as you grow and as your prefrontal cortex develops, it's developing on top of that original program. Calcifying around, like it's calcifying, so, you're building a structure around it now. Right. So now, so now you're living your life and you're just adding this, like I'm alone. But then when you get to the age of, let's say 11, because you're viewing the world through this lens of I am alone, all of a sudden now you're going to start adding context. I am alone because I don't look a certain way. I am alone because I'm not good at this. I'm alone because – and so you, you, the, that, and that's really how we then shape our personalities in a lot of ways. We shape yeah. this construct of who we are that's all built on top of these core emotional wounds, these core – um, core learn limiting beliefs that in a lot of ways are created and, and, and the original seeds are planted at those ages of zero to seven when we don't really have a rational mind to call it out. And we don't really have, uh, uh, we, we don't have the, the tools, let's just call it that, like, at, or, 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 or the, 
the development. The brain is not developed enough to be able to filter things out uh, in a way that we can today. Um, and, you know, as adults. And so um, it is a big part of the work we do. And, you know, it is. Um, and, and once you realize that there's so much empowerment. Exactly. Because that means that you can sort of come back, revisit that and rewire that. You are you know? not, you are not yeah. this. I am alone. You are not, you're not this story. Yeah. That is coming back to the emotion, right? Like you're not an anxious person. You are experiencing anxiety you are not this story or this thought pattern that you are playing out right now. This is a program that was planted or a, 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 an idea that you yeah. formed yeah. at an age where you didn't have all the information. So big, so big. So I think that that just speaks so vaunt right there. Even this conversation speaks to the curiosity of cultivating your emotional intelligence is to also explore some of those places where those seeds may have got planted, whether they were planted by yourself or other, mostly at that age, other. And so that's really powerful step. So second question, <laughs> second definition. Questions are so loaded. I just love them. You're so good. I love this. Yes. Yes. So I'm like, what do I have? What, what kind of person <laughs> have I had a 15 million conversations with for the last couple of years? I mean, you know, oh, you're making me work on this one. I want to understand how you would define, you kind of alluded to it already, but how would you define emotional resilience? Mm. It's a little bit different, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if emotional intelligence is sort of like the, the toolkit for operating, emotional resilience is like the byproduct. Mm. And so when I think of, the like emotional resilience that happens when you have more emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. when you are more aware of your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions, when you can create the spaciousness between what's happening now and what's happening in your nervous system, mm -hmm. when you have the, the positive empowering beliefs uh, instead of the negative limiting ones, um, <laughs> that can allow you to navigate any level of challenge or any level of adversity or the uncertainty of life with more grace yeah. that allows you to be a more emotionally resilient human being. So when I think of emotional resilience, it is all of those things I mentioned. It's being able to um, have a grounded, truly regulated nervous system at the end of the day, that's really what emotional resilience is. It's, 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 it's a part of nervous system health. When your nervous system is not responding to threats, you are a naturally more emotionally resilient human being. When your nervous system is on the side of you, yeah. when, 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 and, and, and those are the things that come from actually pursuing emotional intelligence. So I guess I can, this, it, there's so much that can be covered in, in emotional resilience alone, but you know, that's just a few ways. One is, Love yeah. It. So anyways, I can go in a lot of other directions, but. Well, I think it's really interesting because you kind of talk about the, the emotional intelligence, something you have to kind of learn and cultivate and emotional resilience is sort of the result of that and, and a toolbox, a tool set to, to function from. And so then the next kind of question, which segues in, which is how. I think part of how, well, probably not part, I think it's probably all the reason why we got together um, in our communications with your company and our company is the uh, interest that, so to give folks a little bit of background, I have no idea. I, this is where I wish, wish Steve and Cindy were on the call right now, but our other co-founders, Steve and Cindy, they heard about you guys through something because of something around plant medicines, helping people understand deeper dives into their emotional intelligence or creating cultivating emotional intelligence. They ended up setting up a call with you guys. And that's when they learned that you were far more than that. And that's when you learned that we were far more than maybe what the world was seeing of us as well. And in that moment was the concept where we completely aligned was in this concept of precision mm -hmm. and biochemical individuality and individual experience and all these pieces, which is what kind of created this little bubbling up, you know, spring of when, what else and what else and what else, which is what two and two and a half years or longer, you know, later that we've done a lot of work together. And we'll come into that next after you answer this question. But 
I never, I was trying to think back. I don't know if I ever heard it quite coined this way until I started talking with you. And in fact, I can think of a time when you and Janet, our director of education was sitting around a pool at a conference that you met us up and we were talking about like precision medicine and oncology and the whole bit. And you, I feel like in that moment, created this new term of precision emotional healing. I don't know if you've TM'd that, but should, because it was like, that was this moment that it just clicked for me of, we are looking at the same things yeah. and I am a data driven person of helping like, how do I determine what is the best fit for that person? The best dose, duration, combination, whether that's on the emotional level, the physical level, the spiritual level, the dietary level, the environmental level, whatever the level is getting down to that precision. And when you said that, it was like another click that said, we have work to do here on this planet. So how would you explain to somebody who's sitting on an airplane next to you? What is precision emotional healing? Yeah. So in the same way that you may go and get your, you know, blood drawn or you'd go, you know, get a genetics test or do something like that to then get information about these different aspects of your health, which will then inform what your next steps will be. We run emotional lab reports on you. And then so we track your emotions and we understand your psychology and we get to the root of what is contributing to any level of stress or behaviors or anything that you want to make changes for in your life. And then from there, we pair you up with unique therapies, unique processes, and a unique program that is tailored to your specific situation. And then we track the outcomes from there. We track, okay, like, so it is truly based in like the, the awareness first and doing the deep dive to actually understand what's going on in your system. And then from there, choosing the right tools and therapeutics and modalities um, that are going to meet you where you're at and then right. tracking the impact of that. So precision emotional healing is exactly how it sounds. It's precisely looking at your emotions so that we can get to a specific outcome of a regulated nervous system, more emotional resilience or whatever it is that your goals are for yourself. I love it. And so basically the result, the result of the data of that individual through the precision emotional, um, you know, healing tool helps you cultivate that emotional IQ as well as the emotional resilience to meet life in the world in a very different way. And so that's a lovely segue uh, as to like a lot of people listening right now and be like, well, that sounds really fine and dandy, but what's the real world application with this? Does it really do anything? Is there really any, you know, I mean, you guys remember, I've been studying psychoneuroimmunology since the early 1990s that there's been so much research. I mean, the, the, that word was coined or that concept was coined by Robert Ader in the 70s, maybe the 60s, on and on and on, that there's so much like, people like Candace Pert and her work in our um, our immune system's response to our thoughts, our emotions, the work of Bruce Lipton beyond all of that, looking at how our, our thoughts even impact our epigenetic expression. I mean, there's so much like there is science upon science upon science of how our thoughts, our stressors, our emotions will impact our overall physical well-being, emotional well-being, spiritual well-being, relational well-being, the whole thing. So what I think is really cool is people still might bah humbug it despite the ample evidence supporting it. And this is where when we all got together, it was a really beautiful opportunity because I serve mm -hmm. a lot of doctors and a lot of patient advocates and a lot of patients in what would be perceived as a very high stress high trauma informed environment, which is that of somebody dealing with a cancer diagnosis. Yeah. And so that's where that we kind of collectively saw an opportunity. And I think one that ended up surprising you and your colleagues, um, at the end of the day. So I might have you just take it away from there. When we first got together, I think you guys were thinking cancer schmancer, we're not going down that road <laughs> until we started getting a little deeper together. And I think it's, uh, happily surprised all of us. So please tell us how this evolved and where we are now with this precision healing tool. Yeah, I guess I could just give a little, little story of how, you know, we kind of, I personally fell into cancer. I, you know, I personally haven't experienced cancer myself, you know, knock on wood. Um, and, but I, I, you know, three months, I think before we met, I actually lost a very close friend to stage four cancer. And in the last eight months of his life, you know, he had up until that point, he had been doing all the things, 
he was, you know, he had a top 50 health podcast actually. And so he was like doing all the things literally. And when none of it was really working, he came to the emotional and he came to the spiritual and he came to some of the tools that can help him try something different and look at something else. And, you know, in those last eight months, I saw him do some deep, um, healing, deep trauma, healing, deep self-love work, deep forgiveness work. And he didn't live. Um, you know, he ended up passing and I saw the impact that him doing that type of work had on his family, on the two children that he left behind and the way that they remember him on the way that his wife spoke at his funeral and the legacy of self-love that he left behind. And it was just one of the most empowering and powerful experiences getting to be a part of his life in the way that I was up until the end. And, you know, then three months later, when our partnership kind of fell into awareness, it, uh, it became really clear that, you know, um, supporting cancer families um, is an incredibly important um, mission. It is, it is, it is something that has to exist in the world. Um, and when we started actually taking people through our process, which is a really simple process of, you know, we have our app where you log your emotions in the app and then you attend a 90 minute session where we then track your emotions and the history of your emotions back in time. And as, um, we were taking some of your, your early patient advocates, I think there was one one of your advocates who was an active cancer patient as well. And when she started tracking her emotions back in time, um, as she was recalling memories from the age of 15, she started having pain or agitation where her tumor was. And, and that was the first time we on, on our side were like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, beyond just being able to support the mental and emotional well-being of this incredible human being, this there seems to be evidence, at least in this very direct visceral case, that this individual's cancer has some type of an emotional root contributing to it. And that was really the first moment where we're like, wow, okay, like, you know, emotional resilience goes beyond because at the end of the day, like healing yourself is one of the most surefire ways to become emotionally resilient, to become confident, yeah. to feel like you're on fire, like to get those empowering beliefs, to bring back your faith, you know? So it became a much bigger um, conversation at that point. And it has continued evolving over time where we've now taken hundreds of people from your community, your advocates, we've, we've, you know, worked with your physicians and your brilliant community. I mean, you, you truly do have just such brilliant physicians and advocates on your team um, that are, that are sharing your work in the world. And so to be able to kind of combine forces and be like, okay, like how does emotional resilience also tie to physical lab improvements? How does emotional resilience actually tie to um, relational improvements and quality of life improvements. I mean, there's so much that can be looked at and that's where we've come to. And I, I believe three months ago, we decided to take all of the behind the scenes testing that we were doing and all the impact we were seeing and turn it into a, a, a three month emotional resiliency program for cancer patients, which we called precision emotional healing for cancer. And um, we are just actually wrapping up that cohort and, you know, to see and hear some of the, some of the testimonials and some of the impact. I mean, within three months, people who have never been to therapy, who have never, who, who, who never felt like they needed to until this diagnosis for them to have empowering beliefs in their healing journey for them to having like literally, I just had a conversation today with um, a participant who she's a three time cancer uh, survivor and she joined the program because she didn't want to get cancer again. And time is not the charm. Let's just yeah, stop and, there. And, and she's like, I'm, re I'm willing to throw everything in the bathtub at this. And I'm living in constant terror of this coming back. I'm kind of, of recurrence. And what she told me today was Raj. I'm not afraid of this anymore. 
I have no fear of this coming back. I know in my bones that it's not coming back. Now, I don't know what her life will look like. I don't know what the future will tell. Neither does she. But for her to feel that way is the ultimate definition of emotional resilience. 100%. That to me is the, that's where we want to get to. We cannot control what happens in our lives. We we really can't. We, we'd like to think we can. And so to me, if I even had to paint what is emotional resilience, it is not being at the mercy of life, it is developing the mindset and the tool set to know that I can't control life, but no matter what life throws at me, I am safe, I am calm, and I am here for it. Oof. And Oof. that yeah. is, and and I mean, I can talk so many, but so many other testimonials and all the things that have come out of it, and but it's it's been one of the most. Uh, honestly, soul nourishing opportunity. Like, truly, we are so grateful for the work you do and the opportunities we've had to support uh, just cancer patients in this way. And I, yeah, I just, I'll pause there because it's just mm, it's mm, a lot. That, uh, let that yeah. rain down on everybody for a moment <laughs> because that is probably in the, you know, there's, there's so many elements in the oncology, the cancering journey. There's the prevention of because you have a loved one or you recognize the statistics showing that half of us will be diagnosed with this sometime in our lifetime, right? So a lot of people are like, I'm not doing that. I watched my mother or my grandmother or my best friend or whoever. So there's people who are taking that step. I'll tell you, they're the smallest population though, because I think everyone thinks, ah, oh, it'll never happen to me. Um, and so that group, it's like, hopefully those people are listening right now that say, I'd like to get curious. I'd like to up my EI quotient and my, you know, my emotional resilience quotient to fortify myself in a way that can handle anything coming my way in life. I think that's really big. Then we have the folks that are in the moment of a cancering diagnosis, no matter if it's initial diagnosis to four rounds of, you know, treatment lines later, or what have you that are told, you know, you're, you're cured, you're not whatever, right? Like wherever they are, that's in the moment of a cancer diagnosis itself. And that is often more of like a, I think of that as almost like the survival place of like, I'm just like trying to get through the race. I mean, it's even where in standard of care, when you finish chemotherapy or radiation, you ring the bell at the end and everyone it's like, Oh, the celebration it's over. And yet what people like me and in my world and in your world, what we recognize is actually that bell is actually the starting line. Yeah. It's like, you just like uh, triaged yourself. You like bandaged yourself up enough and now the real work begins, but, but people don't think about that. So if you're listening and you're in that place, I'd like you to maybe try that on for size to understand that cancer was the ultimate wake up call, the ultimate opportunity, the ultimate messenger, and whatever tools you use to get you into a place of sort of safety, um, perceived remission or what have you, that is just like one facet of this. And now the real work begins for you to understand the terrain in which you got sick. And so much of that terrain is involved in what um, Raj and I are talking about. And then you get that third part, which is what um, Raj was just giving an example of, which is what they call survivorship or post-treatment, where I tell you that is in my book, in my experience, and those of you listening, if you agree or disagree, I'd love to hear from you about this. But my experience is that's actually the most dangerous place to be on this journey because it is the place of the unknown. Mm. It is the place of the waiting for the other shoe to drop. It is the place where fear can often drive the car. And when you are driven by fear, you don't have emotional intelligence or emotional resilience. You are reactive and you are leaving a nervous system in a state that um, increases, like de decreases your immune function and increases sympathetic nervous system tone, which increases cellular proliferation and, and uh, migration around the body. And so it is like just that thought process alone. And there is plenty of data and studies showing what I'm saying here. That's the place where I'd really love to make sure that, I mean, people, I'd love for them to have access to you along the whole way, but that's a particular community that I feel like is really left to their own devices because you yeah. kind of, even if you're in standard of care treatment and it's kicking your ass and you're having all the terrible side effects, you are still feeling supported in some way. Yeah. But once you it, you are talk about being alone. And so the three, the three questions that Dr. Um, 
uh, Bruce Lipton asks you when he kind of does kinesiology, just kind of like a site K evaluation. He asks three questions of folks, which this is where I think this ties very much into then you tell us a bit more specific about LB, um, Liberate itself. But he says, you know, the one question you ask your body through this process is, um, do I love myself? That's one question. That's a, that's a doozy, right? <laughs> the, right? It's like, cool, like that went off. And people are like, wait, wait, I've never really asked myself that question. Most or people don't even know what that means. Exactly. You know? and, and, exactly. We'll come back. To, let's, let's yeah. hold that. I want to come back to that. because That's huge. Second question is, um, do I feel safe? And you just spoke to that really well there. And then the third one is, am I healthy? Those are the three questions they ask through the site K process and your body will not lie as you're doing that process and you're having it tested correctly to go through life that one of you know, we're dealing with at least one of those programs being off kilter. Some of us are all three of them are off kilter. And I, you know, when asking him, even while we were together these a few weeks ago, like, how do you fix this? You know, this to me is where liberate comes in because what will help someone overcome those patterns in one person will not be what helps somebody overcome those patterns in another. And to me, when I look at this, if those three questions are still of question for you, you got to get some support. Yeah. You have to even dig in to know if those are questions you can even ask and answer. And so talk to me about, you know, you gave the, the group a little bit about understanding of sort of the process of trigger mapping and going through the evaluation of where, where these patterns started to arise and, and then to align them with sort of what, what treatments seem to fit that pattern the best, because again, you're at that precision approach here, but hearing those three questions and hearing those sort of three phases of the oncology journey, where do you think liberate has the greatest utility? Well, I mean, if you have emotions, <laughs> if you have emotions that are ruling your life, mm. unconsciously ruling your life, I think we have something to offer you. We have a tool that you can go into and between six to six weeks to, to three months, like you'll see measurable improvements in your emotional well being. Um, you know, so that's something that I'll just name there. It doesn't matter where you're at in your journey. Well, another, you know, custom, I would say like a, a case study that we've seen of a patient who's actively in the cancering process. So that stage two person. Um, you know, cancer is the ultimate teacher. You speak so eloquently and beautifully about this, right? So I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to go too deep down that. It is the ultimate wake up call. It is the ultimate cry from your body for love, right? It is the ultimate cry from your body. Pay attention. And, and it's the ultimate sort of like stop, complete stop. Doesn't matter what you're doing. It's time to focus on your health. It's time to look at the choices you're making and make hard decisions, whether that's in your personal life, in your work life, in your relational life, in your, 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 the way you think about life, like doesn't matter. So there's this giant wake up call that's happening mm. in that moment. Now in that moment, you're also facing an existential threat, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So there's that piece of like, okay, I got to figure out who the heck I am happening, yeah. right? Which is the ultimate journey of self-love right? Is coming back to who you are, who you really are, not who you've been for other people, not what you've done in the past, not it's, 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 it's prioritizing your well being. It's prioritizing your authenticity, your, your true self and your desires and creating a life around that. And then the other side, it's like, okay, I'm actually just, I don't feel safe, <laughs> right? Yeah. For, for individuals who are in that process, I believe that what we have is incredibly um, beneficial because not only is the liberate process, so the liberate process begins with a, a, a true assessment, if you would, of your, of your emotions and where they're coming from to pair you up with a plan to help you regulate your nervous system in those moments where you feel unsafe. Mm, in those moments where your fight or flight response is going, like we have tools that we provide you that are personalized to you to calm yourself when you're going into those to go check out your labs and the scanxiety starts coming up. Like we have tools for you to actually yeah. come back to you and feel safe and feel trusting in the process of becoming healthier. And while that's happening, 
we're also showing you why you are the way you are. Hmm. We're hmm. showing you where your patterns come from. We're showing you who you are underneath all of the anxiety and all of the reactivity and all of the things that you thought you were. Hmm. We're showing you the beacon of love that you actually are. And so in in that for for and and that's where like I feel like you know our our process is really beneficial for those that are in the journey because it allows you to transform this 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 thing that happened to you into something that's happening for you Oof. to you know and and then it gives you the rest of your life like yeah I I got this diagnosis I have this thing and this is what it's teaching me. This is what it came here for so that I can step into more of myself. So I can finally have those hard conversations. So I can finally let go of those things that were never serving me in the first place. So I can finally learn how to ask for help. And we support you in a community setting, right? This you know, is we, have, this we have, we have, we have a community of other cancer patients and people who have gone through the process that are all cheering you on as you're making these changes. And so then when you step out of that, into stage three, where now you're in remission, like you have a new purpose, which is the purpose of you. It's not what you do out there. It's not your job. It's not any of that. It's not what you were before your diagnosis. It's who mm -hmm. you are now. Yes. Who you get to step into now. And, and so this, this process is a process of self-discovery. It's a process of emotional healing. It's a process of you learning to be safe, yeah. to be love, and as a result, see the impact on your health. Yeah. Mm. And so, you know, I, I really, doesn't matter where you're at in the journey, I think we have something to offer you. Um, and if you're on the prevention side, you know, I know it's hard to, you know, prepare for something that hasn't showed up yet, you know, and I'll just offer that, you know, everybody gets to feel emotionally well. You know, if you're having challenges in your relationships, if you're having challenges, whether it's your health, relationships, your work, like if you're feeling burned out, like right. there's something that your body's trying to teach you right now. And yeah. we all have emotions that we don't like feeling. So let's just put it that way. Right. So it doesn't have to be until you get dealt with the big T trauma for you mm -hmm. to actually create a nervous system that can also just remove out the impact of little t traumas and all of the accumulations of stress that we have just being alive in the 21st century with global wars happening and economies changing and you know there's so much noise in the world that leads to stress and stress leads to an unwell system and so for many reasons so raj <laughs> just tell you i am so stinking grateful that you Aww. left the world of petroleum in <laughs> me too me too <laughs> thank you honestly oh, we will have links to everything you are doing i want people to follow your podcast i want people to understand about this app and your offerings i want people to understand about the studies that you're going to be you know the beta testing that you're going to be sharing with those results because they're quite remarkable and many more and so i know that there are i know that there are a lot of big fun projects on the on the horizon as far as where this can go i hope this becomes a tool offered in every single oncology practice on the planet and so i'm grateful for you and your team and all you do and thanks for liberating us from the shackles of emotional uh, lack of intelligence. <laughs> Thank you for being. I, I have so enjoyed this. You're such a natural. And that's coming from somebody who's, you know, I've recorded over 300 podcasts over the last five years. And so I don't say this to everybody, but you are just such a curious soul. Like I really feel, and I, I can feel just how deeply you're so brilliant, one. Uh, yeah. so well studied. No, you're so well studied. You're so brilliant, but you have this lightness to you that 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 makes this whole daunting journey feel more approachable and feel less scary. And 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 I and I I I just I'm so grateful for you as just a being, um, and for the chance that I get to just spend more time with you 
in this capacity and to be interviewed by you is such a gift. Um, so thank you for, uh, for holding such beautiful space for such a, a, a fun conversation to happen. Like, I'm like, I'm feeling so lit up right now, just as a result of like your beingness. So uh, I just want to make sure I, I told you that, that I love you. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that, um, that I, that we get to help people in this way and, yeah. and that I get to have you in my life. So thank you. It's totally mutual, my friend. And, and again, deeply grateful and keep up the amazing work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Metabolic Matters. We hope you found today's conversation insightful and empowering. As we wrap up today's episode, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible team and supporters who make this podcast possible. First, we'd like to thank our production team, Alex Sanchez, Cindy Kennedy, Jessica Gilman, and Lynn Hughes for their hard work behind the scenes. Our theme song was written by Julie Newmark and performed by Whiskey Flower. And finally, we wanna thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and being a part of the Metabolic Matters community. Do you wanna learn more? Please visit our website, metabolicmatters.org, and you can follow us on Instagram. If you liked this episode, please leave us a review and share it with your friends and family. And if you want to help support our mission, spreading awareness and knowledge about metabolic health, reach out. We'd love you to join with us. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on upcoming episodes. We have so much exciting content coming your way. Until next time, stay curious, stay empowered, and remember, your metabolic health matters.